Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for attending this session. Uh, today, we're going to talk about OpenWRT and LEDE. Uh, so let's first ask a question. Who knows OpenWRT in the room? Good. Who knows LEDE? Wow, OK, all right. That's going to be interesting. Uh, first of all, let me describe a little bit my, my, about myself. So in 2004, I bought a Linksys WRT54G, from, uh, which was this ancient and venerable router, which got me with, interested in Linux, cross-compilation, and later on OpenWRT. In 2006, I became an OpenWRT developer, which essentially meant having an at, at OpenWRT.org email account. From 2006 to 2013, I was very active with the project. And in 2013, I joined Broadcom to work on set top box, uh, cable modem, Linux, kernel, toolchain, bootloader, root file system. When the LED uh, project was announced, after a couple months of reflection, I ended up choosing to request commit access so I could keep working on the code base while remaining in OpenWRT at the same time, which is kind of a weird thing to do, I guess. But here we are. So in summary, we're going to talk about OpenWRT and LED from a technical perspective, what they are, what they do, why they're useful in the existing embedded Linux landscape. Then we'll talk a bit more in depth into about the design features and a few examples that might be helpful. And finally, we'll talk about the uh, just drama and <laughs> the interesting bits about what's going on in the project and where we currently are, why we're, um, sorry, why did we reach that point, where we are today, and what to expect next as a user and or developer. So let's start with an introduction to OpenWRT and LED. So what are they? So they're essentially three things, if you want to say it. One thing is they're a build system, very much like Buildroot or Yocto. They have, it, they have their own way of building packages. So they have recipes to build other software. Um, they're also Linux distributions in a sense that it's not technically GNU, GNU Linux software. It's more like BusyBox Linux software. But there's also a bunch of custom user space due to the specific niche that OpenWRT and LED want to address, which require this customer user space. And maybe more importantly than all of these two technical things are the communities surrounding the two projects. So wiki, extremely active forums, mailing lists, uh, code repositories, of course, but a ton of users, uh, fewer developers, and a fair amount of contributors to two projects. So if we actually look at what we have, uh, essentially on the left side, we have open source software that could come from pretty much anywhere, HTTP, Git, SVN, you name it, or local file. Uh, you have OpenWRT lead uh, user space components that are either versioned directly with the build system in the same repo or coming as a, in a separate repo. Then there's the core OpenWRT lead that is uh, uh, consisting of make files, a .config based approach, we'll, we'll talk about it a little later, and several tools for different purposes. Um, and so on the right side, in green, you'll see uh, these are kind of the intermediate build products that we have from the build system. So based on user Configuration and selection, you'll get a kernel image for your platform, a root file system that exists in whatever format your platform needs. Could be UBI, UBIFS, JFFS2, EXT4, you name it, basically. Uh, if your platform requires a special bootloader, uh, we can eventually build it as part of the platform. Like if your bootloader is too ancient and you want to use the newer version of U-Boot or something like that, that's a possibility. Um, and finally, we have a tool chain, uh, which uh, open up BRT lead can do, we can do different things. We'll talk about it a bit more, but it's, um, it's more of an intermediate build product to build these other products. In orange boxes, you have kind of the redistributable components. 
So packages, and by that I mean like .ipk packages, so similar to Debian or RPM packages that you can install later on. Uh, you have firmware Im images that are for 95% of the platform supported. You can basically upload that file to the web interface of your router and next reboot you're into open up your T lead. Uh, we have an SDK that allows basically encapsulates the tool chain and the essential parts of the build system. So you, as an application developer, you could create packages directly without rebuilding all of these things. And we have an image builder with, which is more geared towards like integration of existing packages into an existing image. Some of the design goals. So probably the most important is the maintainability of what is it that we're doing with this project. So we're tr as much as possible, we try to work with the latest technologies. And by that, I mean latest kernels as much as possible, latest tool chains, uh, latest TLS, SSL libraries as well, and not use like ancient CGI web interfaces or things like that, more like JSON RPC or uh, other, other things. As much as possible, and that's just like any Linux distribution, try to make frequent updates to the different software that is shipped. Um, another goal of OpenWRT lead is the ubiquity, in that most of the shelf router, uh, routers that you could find out there will be supported within weeks or months after they've been uh, shipped and sold to the public. Most of the time, uh, thanks to the community that does a tremendous job in like reverse engineering the tarball of the uh, of the vendor and just does what it needs to be done in the kernel or tools that open to uses so you can actually get it running on your device uh, with lead there's a desire to extend the scope beyond wireless routers and we'll we'll talk about it uh, and the reasons why there was this reboot slash fork and ultimately, a lot of people in OpenWRT have tried to work with hardware vendors in the past to get OpenWRT enabled on their platforms as the actual standard platform that you would get as a consumer. Second part of the design goals is user empowerment. So since it's open source, you can inspect the code, you can modify it, you can customize it, you can do anything you want. And uh, I don't have exact data to back this claim, but it sh you should see superior quality and control over the vendor provided firmware. If not wireless quality, and that's not the topic of today, at least control is definitely granted because it's open source. Um, one thing that's very tempting is to differenti differentiate yourself a lot from existing projects and OpenWRT and Lead have done a very, very uh, careful job in that area where there's only selected differentiation is that the point, uh, the primary target is wireless routers and DSL cable routers in general. So that specific use case needs to work very well. And uh, it should give you like a state of the art network experience, not something that's hard to configure or to, or to use. And finally, because of that and because of other stuff that got added along this process, it, it, you could consider it a turnkey solution to build real products from. So where do we stand kind of the embedded Linux uh, space in the landscape? So on the y-axis, you have the complexity uh, by that, like how difficult would it be to understand the code as a beginner or uh, first, first time user of the build system? And on the x-axis, you have the number of components and packages supported. So we're kind of in between build root, which is simple to understand. It's got a fair amount of packages supported and has its own feature set. Uh, OpenWRT lead, uh, versus ex the, the blue box is subdivided into a core packages, which is what you get if you just download the build system and the core packages. And then there's a notion of feeds that allows you to extend the uh, distribution with more packages. So once we start adding that, we're closer to the thousand plus packages available and supported by the distribution. And finally, we have Yocto Open Embedded, wh whose scope is a lot different, and which is 
in my opinion, much more complex to comprehend as a first time user. In terms of release timelines, so uh, interestingly, uh, Bill Root served as a basis for OpenWRT back in 2003. So the Bill Root build system was there, got forked, got heavily modified to support exclusively the Linksys WRT54G, add support for creating .IPK packages, and from there, a new timeline existed until sometime last year where LED spun off and created its own timeline. So kind of a hint, if you look at this timeline, you'll see that, uh, for instance, the Kamikaze release, which was 8.09 after the year and the month it was released, essentially covered three years. And this pattern kind of repeats itself. So one complaint that people have made about OpenRT is the lack of frequent releases. And we'll see later that it's actually a big problem. Um, LED has just released 16.01.0, uh, uh, I think it was two days yesterday, depending on the time zone. So uh, congratulations. And uh, the, the arrow we have in dotted line is whether OpenWRT and lead will reconcile. Uh, a word or two about router security. Uh, I think this has been, I'm very pleased to see that this has been a very important topic for this session of ELC. I cannot stress this out. Uh, I, I, I can't stress it enough that having control over your router should be your top priority as a citizen, as a user, or as a developer, because they're by far the most interesting attack surface for a lot of things, in particular botnets. Uh, most times there's no monitoring software running on your router. There's a ton of security flaws that nobody is looking into fixing, but be rest assured that a lot of hackers are interested in exploiting. And there's millions of Linux devices vulnerable out there, uh, which make them extremely easy to, and, and we've like selected like maybe one, two, three specific architectures. So they're all gonna be pretty much the same MIPS, pretty much the same ARM processor. So you write one exploit for these guys and you're gonna address a lot of devices. It, and it's the gift that keeps on giving. Every day or almost every day or every month you hear about new security vulnerability that is affecting Zyxel routers or QNAP NASes or what have you. Uh, so don't rely on the vendor to fix this, take control. Now we'll talk about a few design like the actual design of the build system and toolchain SDK features and examples. So the build system is written in GNU makefile. It's not Python or Big Bake or things like that. It produces .ipk files for software packages and kernel modules. Um, that actually means that every, when you write a recipe for a package, the build output you get out of this is an IPK file that we later on install into the root file system we're going to create. So everything is a redistributable package by design and by default. It abstracts all the auto tools, CMake, bare metal makefile, uh, libtool patching and things like that, as you may expect it. Uh, there's a make menu config based interface which is mostly in curses. Um, there's a whole lot of effort put into dependencies resolution and configuration validation. So for instance, if there are kernel modules that are not available for your specific kernel version, they'll just not be uh, selectable, for instance. It supports partial rebuild of everything. So if you, say, started midway and then interrupted your build, your tool chain is halfway there, it will restart where it left. It won't like erase the whole tool chain and then continue again. Uh, it supports building uh, for different targets, for instance, MIPS or ARM, ARM64, what have you, within the same source tree. So within a few commands, you can actually switch between build environments, and it's parallel whenever it's possible. So natural question would be, well, why not use Billroot or Yocto? So Billroot did not and still does not support packages. That's, that's part of the design goal, and that's, that's great. But it was a great basis to start from. Uh, Yocto OE is a little too complicated and also too slow. Uh, maybe we're getting more into the church war here, so might not be that interesting. 
the menu config based interface kind of looks like this. So for instance, at the top, you're going to choose your target system. Um, uh, there's a notion of sub-targets, which I'll explain a little later, which is kind of an additional layer of customization. Then there's another layer called profiles. And then you could, in target images, for instance, you could choose what file system you want to target, init RAMFS, SquashFS, GFFS2. Uh, you can configure so-called advanced configuration options, like how you want a toolchain to which toolchain version do you want, kind of which BNU tools version, which GLBC version, just which GCC version. Uh, you could decide if you want to build the image builder SDK, and then we move on to the actual package selection, which is organized in categories. So base system, networking, utilities, libraries. And the more packages you add, the obviously the menu expands. So about the tool chain. So OpenWRT and Lead prefer using vanilla GCC and binutils. For some time, we used the Lenaro tool chain. And finally, we're back into the vanilla uh, versions. And there's additional patches, which are mostly customizations about like code model for specific platforms. The only exception is Arc, which was just submitted by Synopsys, and it's still a work in progress with the upstream GCC. The default is so-called internal build, in that you let OpenWRT build your tool chain from scratch, so downloads all the sources, builds binutils, GCC first pass, C library, GCC second pass, and then you're done. Uh, but you can also use an external tool chain if you desire. So it could come from cross it could be like a code sorcery binary toolchain. And um, uh, OpenWRT leads support glibc, uslibc, next generation, which is the continuation of uslibc, and musclelibc. Although the default is musclelibc nowadays. In terms of kernel, um, it's uh, OpenWRT and Lead try to use the vanilla kernel and track LTS releases. So right now we're at 4.4. Next one is going to be 4.9. Uh, there are OpenWRT slash Lead patches, which are a collection of platform agnostic patches that are necessary for the system to bootstrap and or to extend functionality that's not upstream in the kernel yet. And there are platform specific patches. Um, as a developer, you might prefer the option of building an external kernel, which could be on a dedicated directory, and or you might want to clone directly from a Git repo, for instance, with branch and everything. One particularity compared to other build systems is that the kernel configuration is managed via fragments. So I'll explain a little later, but there's each layer can add or remove the kernel configuration. So it can be both a pain and a blessing at the same time. So if we look, for instance, at, can you guys read this or? Yeah, OK. Well, all right, well, so I'll, I'll move over here. So this is kind of a, an example of a package make file that you would want to write if you were to port an application and try to build it. So on the topmost rectangle, you would define like the package name, package release, which is going to be used by the uh, IPK uh, part of the build. How you would want to download it, so this one's, for instance, coming from Git, so you're going to specify the protocol as Git, you're going to indicate what's the U URL to download it from. Uh, package source date is kind of, since it's a Git snapshot, you, the, the two key identification uh, metric is going to be the date and the commit, and then there's a hash to verify the download. Uh, uh, we, we're going to have, in the third box, we're going to have like a package license, which is useful for future extraction. If you need to like produce like a compliance list or something, the person responsible for it. Then we include uh, makefile macros that are going to uh, utilize this information. We, in the one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, four, whatever. Uh, we're going to define where the package is going to appear in the make menu config. So this one is in the base section, and the category is, I can't even read myself, sorry, <laughs> in the base system. Uh, then there's going to be a bunch of dependencies that we can express. So this one depends on two packages. One is libubox, and the other one is libjcency. 
and then a title, which is just kind of a friendly name if you wanted to search for it in make menu config, and the URL of where the upstream source for that package. Uh, finally, the, the most interesting part is the, not the final, the previous to final section, which is how do we actually create the package? And this one's very simple. You create a user slash bin directory, and then you stage your binary in there, which is called uh, JSON path, and the sources we call JSON filter in the um, final package. And finally, we add the package to the build system, which is just like an eval call uh, package macro slash the name. So this heavily relies on GNU make macros. So it's not as simple as, say, build root if you're familiar with it, but it's, it's, it's kind of an abstraction built on top of it. But it's still GNU make file syntax, so humans can understand it, hopefully. Uh, example workflow. So for instance, if we take our package uh, from an existing build system, it would be very easy to just like build, clean, compile, and install the package. So these three commands would, of course, expand to three different make targets, but you would, it's as simple as that, for instance. So if, you, if you're iterating over development of your package, you don't need to type make all the time, wait until you arrive at the section where the build system builds JSON filter, it can just do it there. Uh, another example is, for instance, if you have ETH tool, but it's not enabled in your, kernel conf in your current config, you could still override that by just enabling it very much like you would do with like the kernel or maybe other key config based system. And you can just say, well, download the sources. So that's what it does. And finally, one thing that OpenWRT and Lead use a lot is something called Quilt, which is a way to manage patches within a directory. So it's, uh, it's kind of poor man's version of Git from when it existed. So if you have like patches that apply on top of an upstream package, you could manage them directly from the build directory and remove, add new files, whatever. The platform layer. So this is probably the most interesting part of but one of the most interesting parts about OpenWRT, so there's four distinct, four distinct layers in the build system that are created. The first one is the generic layer. So in that layer, you're going to find the generic configuration, the kernel configuration that's common to all platforms. So not just one, like all of them. For instance, uh, SquashFS is going to be enabled for pretty much all platforms, or JFFS2. All the, everything that makes sense to be shared is there. Uh, you're also going to find some patches, the open rarity specific patches that I mentioned before. Like um, for a long time we had like a custom implementation of uh, the exe decompression on top of UBIFS for instance. That, that wasn't part of the mainstream kernel so that was added. And we have base files which are going to be added into the root file system. Then you could subdivide that into multiple platforms. So if you looked at the source tree, you would see, for instance, the popular Afros AR71XX platform being one platform. You would see X86 being another one. You would see um, a Brockham DSL router as another one, for instance. So these platforms can also augment the generic kernel config and patches with their own specific um, changes. And the same thing goes with base, base files. One additional thing we could do at that layer is we can also change the default package selection. So if your platform wants, uh, let's say, uh, USB kernel modules, you could put that information in there. It's not mandatory, but it's one way to do it. Another layer that we have is the so-called sub-target, uh, which is if there's like something if your platform, the, the best example I can come up with is if your platform, for instance, exists in two different Indian nests, one little Indian, one big Indian, you would most likely create a little Indian sub-target and a big Indian sub-target. And there you could define specific kernel configuration that most likely enable little Indian, disable big Indian, and vice versa. And finally, uh, you can have a profile which is a way to further customize the package selection and the base files, as well as the firmware creation. So some platforms, uh, some SOCs, for instance, are existing in routers and NASes. 
for instance. And so routers would typically run from Flash, Spy, NAND, and NAS devices may run from like a internally attached hard drive. So if you need to make that kind of distinction, you could do it there. Hopefully this is a little more readable. Uh, so if you want to define a platform, it's pretty simple. At the top, you're going to include the macros you need. You define the architecture, which is used by both the kernel configuration and the toolchain. So here, for instance, it's ARM. The board name is RealView, which is like a emulation platform from ARM. Uh, features is kind of like what your platform supports. Um, so this one supports an FPU, which is going to influence how the toolchain is built and supports RAM disk, but we could put additional stuff in there. Uh, if you have additional CPU specific optimization that you would need to specify, like this one is like a MP core version and supports VFP. But if you had a newer version, you could put that it's like a Cortex A15 supports VFP4 and you could like target specifically that ABI and floating point model if you wanted to. Uh, we're going to tell which kernel patch version this is. Um, the device type is a way to influence the default package selection. So for instance, for a developer board, you may not want IP tables, uh, bridging, stuff like that. Uh, we give it like a, dis a uh, short description to appear nicely as a user-friendly name in the menu config presentation. Finally, a kernel name, which is the when you do like make uh, arch equals arm, what is the final image that you want to build? This one wants a Z image. And finally, we add it to the build system by just calling this line. Uh, same thing as with packages, it's reasonably easy to work with uh, with the platform, so you could like build just the kernel modules if you wanted to. You could build kernel image and firmware. Uh, you could manage the patches with Quilt. And maybe more interesting, you could actually switch between environments. So if you have an ARM-based platform, you could create a new environment for that, which is essentially going to save your .config file and a bunch of other stuff that could be moving around between builds. Uh, switch to it type make, stop there, and then switch back to say your MIPS platform that you're working on. One thing that's pretty cool is that even kernel modules are packages, which means that you can actually install them later on. So it's kind of the same idea as before, you define a kernel module package name. You see here it's like Tygon3, the Broadcom driver. You tell the build system which kernel config option it's keyed on. What are the dependencies? Um, which file to copy. So this one is like drivers.net, evernet, brocom, tg3.ko. Then a, we don't use mod probe in open OT LED for like space constraints. So instead you kind of have to teach the ins mod. Uh, if there's dependencies order, you would, you would use a number to indicate that and finally add it to the build system. One thing that's also very popular and useful is to extend the default package base is something called feeds, which are essentially URLs to other packages. So for instance, here we have two examples. The first one is uh, SRC git means you're going to download for git. Uh, packages is the name of the feed, which is going to be like an identifier to find these packages later on and the URL where these packages are. But you could, you could think of the second one as like, you have your local development repository of package, package recipes that is called custom, and it's just like a symbolic link or directory. And from there, there's a feeds script within the sources that allows you to search, uh, update packages, and install them. Install in that case means tell the build system how to find it and how to build it later on. One thing that I alluded to earlier is the image builder and SDK. So the image builder is essentially a way for you to take an existing image of a router, for instance, that you have, say, a WRT 54G, and you've built just the minimum amount of packages. And then later on, you're like, oh, wouldn't that be great if I could just add OpenVPN to this firmware image, create a new firmware image with that, and then install that on my base of router. So that's exactly the use case the image builder is for. So it contains the kernel image, a bunch of recipes and tools, 
and allows you to recreate firmware image using pre-compiled packages on the left side as an input. The SDK is the, the next step. Like if you have, if you want to redistribute a tool chain, that's essentially what you would do. You would use the SDK, which contains the tool chain, recipes, and tools, takes open source software as input or proprietary software for that matter as input on the left side and produces a binary package that is redistributable. So if you link the two together, you can actually get source, package, package to image. Uh, we are now into why did we actually create all this custom user space in OpenIRT LED? So the reason why is it's, it's manifold. The first part is that modern systems require coordination between heterogeneous components. Like in a traditional, back in 2003, for instance, your embedded system will have like maybe a DHCP server, a PPPoE session, your PPPoE session, your DHCP server doesn't even know about it, right? So that's not really, you could work things out with scripts and stuff, but it still wouldn't be the way it should be done. Uh, if you have any kind of user interface, CLI, command line interface, web, graphical user interface, they're going to change the system configuration. So that needs to be told to the applications that care about the configuration system. It's not just a hub signal that you send to the package, uh, to the software. Uh, networking devices are incredibly more complex these days, and we'll talk about it a little more, but it's, it's no longer IPv4 DHCP to provision your device. It's, it's a lot more com complicated. And finally, since we're, we want to be able to update frequently, we need a proven and working update mechanism that does not rely as much as it can on the bootloader or something that's vendor specific. So if we look at the OpenIoT lead software stack, we essentially have six different components. So the first one on the left is called NetIFD, which is essentially a network management daemon, which, is respons which is just deals with event-driven networking. So for instance, Ethernet link comes down, everything gets disabled, even Ethernet link comes back up, everything gets re-enabled, VPN gets re-established, and things like that. So it's gonna deal with the stacking of network devices, basically. We have something called PROCD, which is a process monitoring daemon, kind of like SystemD, if you want to think about it, that does uh, jailing, hot plug, uh, hot plug messages generation, watchdog, syslog, uh, in its scripts. Uh, then we have Lucy, which is the web interface. It's written in Lua. It supports uh, plugins and modules, so it can be made dynamic as you install and remove packages. Uh, it's got a JSON, R it uses JSON RPC to talk to other parts of the system, and it's got a so-called UBoost export, which export, which I'll talk about it. The, the binding blue arrows are actually what's uh, so-called UBus, which is the system bus. So it's essentially DBus on your desktop, except it's smaller and simpler. So UBus is socket-based IPC bus, very much like DBus, supports ACL, so you could say this packet, this daemon can talk to this daemon, not this one. Uh, it exports, exports methods and signals, so you can call into other packages, uh, sorry, call into other software through that bus, and you can also subscribe to notifications and events, and it supports a binary and a JSON data format. And finally, we have UCI, which stands for Universal Configuration Interface, which is a, config a central configuration database to store everything that your system needs to know about, like my host name, my uh, network configuration, and things like that. Supports, uh, it's a transactional model, so it supports commit and rollback in case something wrong happened. System upgrades, so system upgrades work consistently across all your devices. They're independent of the boot medium, so whether you use SpyNor, SpyNet, EMMC, it's gonna work the same way. The only thing we need is the platform to tell us where to flash a firmware image because I, I, we can't guess that, right? So how to identify the image? Like, is this image really for my platform? And how do I, for instance, put the kernel here and the, and the root file system here? And then what the system does is freezes all system activity, moves, does a pivot root to slash TMP and TMPFS, which means that your flash can now be used and there's no dangling file descriptor and stuff like that, rewrite everything, 
and next thing you know, you reboot into the new version, and all the configuration files are preserved. Another thing that's interesting is called OverlayFS. So it just made it, it we had, it's, if you're familiar with UnionFS, the idea is that you want to assemble two different file systems under a single uh, namespace, mount namespace. So what, is, what this is used for in OpenIoT and LEAD is to provide a read-only partition of your system that contains everything that's needed to boot to a shell and to allow you to do recovery. So you can't do rm-rf slash and have all your system wiped out. If you want to, there's an option to do it, but by default, there's at least the base system that's preserved. And then there's another partition mounted on top of that which allows you to do read-write operations. So you'll get installable package to work just fine. And finally, there's a fail-safe mechanism that's typically provided through device-specific buttons. Most, most routers have like a reset button or a factory default button. So when you press that for X amount of seconds, uh, you could, you're dropped into a shell where you can do recovery operations. Networking today. So back in the good old days, we had Ethernet, DHCP, and we'd be done with it. Uh, nowadays, you can have your network connection coming from pretty much anywhere. Ethernet, 3G, 4G, XDSL, Doxis, and you could have, you could have different provisioning protocols, DHCP, router advertisement plus DHCP v6, and IP or IP6 configuration protocol. And with IPv6 being massively deployed with ISP, there's many different ways to provide IPv6 to end gateways. Could be 6RD, DSLide, MAPP, MAPT, 464 translate, you name it. So why did we, why, since we have all of this today, the idea is that you should not have to configure much more than what's in these boxes. So if we, what's common to all of these parts is that you're going to configure just the bare minimum for your network interface. So if it's like Ethernet, you're going to say my one interface is on ETH1. It's provisioned for DHCP. I also have a 1.6 interface, which is a logical name for my interface, and it's provisioned for DHCP v6. Similarly, I'm, I'm going to do the same thing, 3G, 4G, PPPO, whatever. And then we're going to let NetIFD do all the magic. So NetIFD basically orchestrates all these devices, devices configuration into one central location. It calls into protocol-specific handlers. So if you have a new protocol you're working on tomorrow, it's very easy to extend it. You don't have to rebuild the whole system. And it's going to deal specifically with physical or virtual devices like Ethernet, XDSL, tunnels, VLANs. And whenever your network device does something, it's going to propag propagate through the UBUS system bus, and the firewall configuration can be adjusted. Uh, your DNS mask, DHCP caching server can be restarted or reconfigured. Uh, you can have network aware services, say Samba, DLNA, UPnP to be restarted or reconfigured and it will fire uh, instances of protocol clients, for instance, like DHCP client, things like that. Now, a few things that are interesting in terms of security compared to other embedded systems and built system is that OpenWRT by default supports full railroad, which is read-only reallocation of your ELF executable when it gets loaded. It's configurable, you could disable it, you could do full or partial. It does uh, format security checking, so if you have like a printf, scanf um, statement that's unsafe, the compiler can tell you that. It supports source fortification as native support for stack smashing protection for both user and kernel, and all IPK packages are assigned so that avoids like mine in the middle attack where I could try to sneak in a malicious update of the package to you. There's a few interesting runtime security features as well. So there's a notion of jails, which is supported, supported by PROCD, the, the monitoring process, which basically allows you to it's kind of think of it as a dynamic CS route where you specify only the files that you need that should be made available to your process. So this is super helpful for applications that are known to have security vulnerabilities like Samba or DNS mask. 
And on top of this, on top of doing file system level restriction, you could do system call level restriction through the use of seccomp. So you could list exactly which system calls your application should be allowed to use. Some other cool features and goodies is that there's existing ARM, ARM64, MIPS, and x86 targets that run natively in QEMU. So if you don't want to flash anything on your device, you just want to run this on your PC, tinker with the system, there's ready, uh, ready to be built images. You can have your packages with separate debug information. You could also have a tool that helps you with like GPL compliance or if you're like a vendor and you need to provide a list of packages and which license they have, the build system can do that for you as well. You could work off a local package mirror, an alternate download directory, which is useful if you're like in a corporate environment and you can customize everything you want in user space. Areas of improvement, because there's obviously some. So we essentially lack continuous integration testing. It's kind of hard. We have, well, we have essentially the same challenges as the kernel people. Uh, maybe worse because <laughs> this requires actual physical devices. And what you could test with emulators are probably never going to break in the emulator, but always going to break in a system. And like the upgrade mechanism is something that's kind of hard to test. So fortunately, the community is active and is providing feedback, but clearly having a board of farms would be something that helps. Something OpenIRT and LEAD have traditionally been criticized on is the lack of upstream uh, work. So there's like about 170 patches against the 4.9 kernel right now just for the generic part of the kernel. So not counting additional targets and stuff. That's way too much. So there's an ongoing effort to migrate the most popular platform, the Qualcomm Aphros, into device tree, which is probably going to be a fun exercise. Um, another thing that could be good to have is have an opt-in or opt-out security updates, like automatic updates of your, if not the whole system, at least the packages that are important or can be vulnerable. And as just pretty much like any other open source project documentation. And one thing that people uh, regularly ask about is what's the best supported device. So if we could come up with like a good metric for evaluating the support of a particular device, then we could like have a top 10 or something like that. Conclusion. So works great on your router, uh, but it would also work great anywhere else if you're willing to give it a shot on like a tablet or PC, an embedded system or whatever. It, you can use all, all these features that are router centric, like you could ditch them and replace them if you want it. It's reasonably fast, versatile, and flexible. It's a turnkey solution for products, but if you're more into doing like embedded systems development or kernel development, you could also use it. It's very convenient for that purpose. And we have extremely active communities. And now let's talk about the drama. <laughs> All right, so what happened last year? On March 5th, 2016, a group of OpenRT developers announced the formation of LEAD. And there were essentially two types of reaction. Most people immediately welcomed LEAD and just switched to it. And a smaller group did not acknowledge the problems being stated. And well, a flurry of email ensued and went pretty much nowhere. Essentially what that meant though is there was a problem with OpenRT that need to be fixed and maybe not just one problem. So why LED? So first of all, more transparency. All decisions are now made public. There's a governance mailing list that will list all the decisions that the pro project is making and all these decisions must be collectively approved and everyone has equal decision rights. There's a established and clear process and guidelines as well to operate the project. So how to resolve conflicts, how to do external communication to vendors, to press, to, and how do we make a release and how do we decide when and how to make a release. There's also less centralization. OpenIRT was essentially hosted on one single machine where every service was, which is a huge single point of failure. And so there's been like a all the services are now spread, uh, GitHub for the source code, but also a clone on a different server, a different mailing list provider, et cetera. And there's therefore freedom to move 
all the project services uh, just to follow the requirements, basically. And one big complaint from the user base, but also internal developers, was the lack of predictability on the release schedule. So lead 17.0.1 is a good example that this was addressed. And um, finally, there should be like an easier integration process from contributor. If you're submitting frequent patches to a developer where you get like commit rights and you, you're part of the development team. Meanwhile, in OpenRT, surprise, as in not a good surprise, uh, there were few people left, like maybe seven to six, and even fewer active, like maybe four or five. So clearly that, that wasn't a good thing, but it was probably a good thing to, to get a wake-up call. So there's been, unfortunately, inappropriate responses in that lack of response entirely from some people. Uh, people who were part of the OpenWRT and moved to lead at, at openwrt.org emails. Those emails get disabled, which means that they were unable to receive emails from before, which was still active. So this was a totally inappropriate response. And unfortunately, this was a, tech, a emotional response and not a technical response. So where are we today? So the reuni reunification terms are very simple. The lead code base is going to be used moving forward because it's been actively maintained. It's been receiving a steady stream of patches and contributions. OpenRT in the meantime has been completely quiet and flat. The OpenWRT team has been given lead repository access so we can make changes. We're considered lead committers, committers like anybody else. And there's discussions on whether OpenWRT should stick as a name. It's a trademark name. It's also a brand. It's got, I mean, probably, I mean, a lot of you know about the name, so that, that's got to be something. It's got a larger popularity. But unfortunately, right now, it's a stalled discussion. Nothing has happened past couple free meetings. So what next? The release is finally out, which means that we should be able to focus the energy on bringing the two projects together and not getting a release out. Um, back, I'm echoing to my earlier slide, we need def desperately need a truly open source project that supports wireless routers and not DDWRT, not tomato firmware, not what have you, open up your T because it's, it's shooting to be open source, auditable, frequently updated. Um, and on the, tech, the project uh, human side, we, need, we essentially need to discuss and agree. So discuss in person, discuss more frequently uh, on the reunification term and literally bury the hatchet. So I'm thinking about buying one just for that. Uh, <laughs> symbolic. <laughs> uh, and I'm linking here an email from an OpenWRT developer entitled State of the Union, where he's essentially saying that the, the, reunif if you, sorry, the reunification terms are accepted by OpenWRT, and this was three days ago. So hopefully we'll be moving from there. If you want to be browsing the websites or looking for references, you can find them here. And now if you have questions, uh, I'm wide open to answer them. No reactions, really? Uh. I have a technical question at the uh, image builder. Uh, who is using that? Do you see usage of that? Um, I, I kind of feel if I'm a developer, I have the whole build system. I directly build my image. Or are you also Oops. Okay, so the question is, what's the purpose of the image builder and who uses that? So the image builder is like, uh, you don't want to, you're not a developer, you don't know how to compile, you don't really know anything. The only thing you know is you want this package inside your firmware image and you want to go there as fast as you can. So it's usually it's end users that would typically use that feature where they start with the base open area T image and then they start customizing it by adding additional package they found on the internet. So you have community members actively using it? Yeah. 
a lot of, like in Germany, there's a lot of uh, wireless communities like Freifunk and, and these guys, and they heavily utilize that feature. Yes? Oh, yeah. So the question is about reproducible builds. So uh, there's been an effort last year to get closer to reproducible builds uh, with the help of the Debian packages, uh, patches that they've done. Uh, I can't tell you like what's our coverage percentage or things like that, but there's definitely people looking into it. There's like at least a couple of people um, regularly contributing changes to make that happen. But yeah, this is super important for security. Yes. Uh, so the question is, if I have any insights on the uh, uh, what's XGUI? Yeah, well, uh, oh, Lucy. oh, Lucy. Yeah. So, no, no, no worries. So Lucy. So yeah, the the state of on Lucy. So we the the, the deployed interface is currently Lucy you know, version one. Uh, there's a Lucy two that's being worked on. Uh, so I heard, but I've never seen the code, source code so far. So I don't I don't really know where we are. Uh, I and I don't even know what problems they want to address other than maybe being faster. And, may, and more JavaScript, more uh, client-side validation, and things like that. Right. I mean, uh, if, like the original version of the web interface was written in GNU hook, hook which was like, I don't know, it was fun, but uh, <laughs> very difficult to hack. <laughs> Other questions? All right, going once, going twice. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, no, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, so the question is like, we have tons of little devices with very, very small memory footprint, typically eight megabytes of flash. Uh, yes, there's ongoing, sorry. Oh, RAM? Yes. Uh, I mean, it would be a challenge to even get Linux to not out of memory in eight megabytes of RAM, I think. So I wish we could do that, like there's a, I know this was like the motivation for the, some versions of the WRT54GL and stuff that were running VxWorks instead of Linux because you, with twice as less RAM you could get like maybe a few cents down your product and that was meaningful, but these were running VxWorks. So I, as much as I'd like to, I don't think it's feasible with a modern kernel. You, you'd probably have to go back to 2.4 for that. Thank you.